said here stays here, but what's learned here leaves here. So we're going to ask people, rather than attributing quotes to a specific person, oh, all of a sudden my mic came on. Um, I don't need to yell anymore. Rather than attributing quotes to, quotes to a specific person, to just kind of do the quote and then use the hashtag. Um, and CCI as an organization is really um, uh, excited to kind of support all the brilliant thinking coming out of these conversations. Um, I want to pause though and see, are there any other kind of agreements that we may want to um, kind of lift up and honor as we move through the rest of our day together really quickly? Okay. I'm just going to do a scan of the room, awkwardly make eye contact with all of you. I'm going to keep scanning, keep scanning. And so what I'll try to do if you're talking, I'll probably like go like this. If I can't hear you, chances are other people can't hear you either. Great. Thanks. Keep scanning, keep scanning. Great. Well, we're going to go ahead and jump into it. Um, super excited to kind of follow the conversation that we all just had together. Um, I'm ready to sign up for Noni's master class whenever she's teaching, any of the seminars. Um, we'll have Jessica and Lauren continue to kind of come in and be guest speakers as well. Um, but we really want to kind of continue on the thread. And so to do that, um, our panel is called Building Economic Wealth to Transform Communities. Um, and so we have um, Mia from the Boston Ujima Project and Ojan from the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative to kind of take us through some concepts um, that touch on um, this topic broadly. Um, just to provide a quick frame for what we're really trying to lift up in our piece, um, is that while all of our projects are explicitly trying to build economic wealth for the communities that we are part of, the communities that we support and serve, we're really clear that the, that's not the end goal, right? The work doesn't end there. Um, Noni really lifted up that we need to kind of think about the long-term governance and management um, of our communities. And in that same vein, um, I also really look at how do we leverage the economic power that we're building to be able to ensure that we're also building political power, right? So that people can continue to contest for the things that they need to, to make these, to make thriving, a thriving quality of life for themselves and their communities. And so we're gonna kind of delve into some of the concepts around governance, around building political power, around how capital shapes all of those pieces, and then hopefully be able to also engage in some intimate and vulnerable conversations around the lessons learned um, to do this work. Um, so I'm gonna kick it off. Um, with one of the first uh, questions. Um, so the first question is um, really focused in around governance, right? And so um, one of the things I've been reflecting on in my work is that there's a way that we still kind of engage with governance as being transactional, right? Governance as about um, turning people out to vote and that's it. And I think all of our work, we're also starting to see that we're Understanding that governance is about how we're building community, really deepening relationships. Um, and with that, governance is also really hard. Um, so I wanted to kind of um, invite you to talk about your governance structures and to explicitly talk about how you design the governance structures for your projects in a way that helps to decouple capital from power. Right, um, really being able to ensure that the money coming in is not shaping the overall governance um, of the project itself, and um, and it'd be great if you could like maybe open with a couple two sentences about your project as well for, for those of us that still don't know about the great work you're doing. Starting with me, however we want to do. Sure, and can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Uh, so uh, again, my name is Nia Evans. I'm with Boston Ujima Project. Um, I have never successfully um, really come up with two sentences to describe <laughs> uh, what Ujima does. Um, so I always try. Uh, so I'll give a couple of different versions uh, if, if that's okay. Um, so it's interesting when Angie asks the question 
um, about who would lead uh, such an economy that we're talking about. That's actually one of the ways I describe Ujima, is I say um, Ujima is a model, although I don't really believe in models, but I do use the word model, of what our economy would look like if it were run by us. And by us, I mean uh, black, brown, and indigenous people. And so uh, that's one of the ways I've, I've talked about Ujima. Uh, something else we say is Ujima is a cooperative finance, investment, and arts ecosystem. Um, every single word in that phrase being important. So cooperative is important. Uh, ecosystem is important. Arts, finance, and investment is important. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there just with the, the two-sentence uh, description. Um, I also say cooperative economics infrastructure uh, is something that we do. In terms of governance, uh, so jumping from our ecosystem approach to what that then means for governance, um, that, that actually means that we, we have a lot of bodies um, and it's complex, uh, to your point about it, about it being hard. At the simplest level, uh, one body that I can talk about is our membership body. And we have, um, if you were with us in the early days, we had this giant sprawling ecosystem chart that we would show people that would be amazing and overwhelming at the same time. Um, and smack dab in the middle it was our membership body that we also called our general assembly. And uh, our membership is um, placed into two broad classes. Uh, so there's our general membership, which we also call our voting membership. And that is comprised of people who are residents of Boston proper. Um, we are explicitly focused on working class people of color. And um, so there's even within that a self-organizing principle that we invite people to use. So we say if you are a resident of Boston proper, um, which entitles you to a voting membership, but you do not identify as working class or you do not identify as a person of color, uh, we invite you to consider our other broad membership, which is our solidarity membership. And that is for people who live outside of Boston proper. And we're happy to say that we've seen um, um, a good number of people exercise that option. So we've seen a good number of white people, for example, who live in Boston take out solidarity memberships, and we've seen a number of people who've, who feel like they're a little more solid financially uh, than who we would like to focus on uh, do similarly. Um, and so one of the, so just in terms of governance and decision making and um, power, um, it's built in um, upon your initial entry into Ujima. So you're, you're uh, your membership, um, or what I would say is the way we've designed our membership is with the principle that those who are impacted by decision making should be the ones making the decision. And so um, if we know that we are wanting to invest in Boston proper, and right now we are focused on Boston proper, and we do know that we have to very, very soon think about areas outside of Boston, um, it is people inside Boston who should be determining those invest who should be determining those investments. Uh, so that's baked into our membership. Um, so on that note, what do our members vote on? Uh, they, vote, they vote on our investments, and they are direct votes. Uh, our process is that we hold neighborhood assemblies. Um, if anyone's familiar with Cooperation Jackson's work, they'll, they'll be very familiar with the types of assemblies that we hold, which are essentially uh, gatherings of community members and our members. And what we do with our assemblies is we say that half of the, for us, a successful assembly is if half of the participants are Ujima members and then the other half are community residents who are not members of Ujima. And so what's important about that is we don't want to unwittingly transmit the notion that you have to have some type of organization affiliation to determine what's happening in your communities. So you are entitled to that decision making by virtue of being there. Um, and you should have that whether we exist or not, whether Ujima is around or not. Um, and so at these assemblies, we ask our members uh, three broad questions. We ask them, what are the businesses that you love? Uh, what are the businesses that we need? Uh, what does, what's not currently in our communities that you would like to see? And what are the businesses that we need to replace? Um, we've done another version of this where we've tried to be a little more interactive uh, um, and, and we've kind of done a day in a life with members. And we've asked uh, members and community members to think about their day and to think about all of the purchases that they make throughout their day, who they purchase from, what the service or product is like and what the experience is like, and um, what, they, what they believe about that 
businesses impact on our community. And so from there, we get a list of businesses, and we also get an idea of why community members are naming these businesses. Um, we do then uh, have, a, have a bit of an intermediary body, so we do have an investment committee, um, and the charge of that investment committee is to uh, take some of the early work that we've done with these businesses. Um, we also run them through our community standards process, which has also been created by community members and voted on by community members. Um, so as an example, community members have said, um, as a standard, and this is a non-negotiable, if a business does not meet this, they do not receive investment from us, um, it has to be at least 50% people of color ownership. There are guidelines with regards to ownership by women, uh, guidelines with regards to the pay ratio, so there can't be more than a five to one pay ratio, for example. Um, so there are 36 different standards. Um, and so uh, we have an investment committee. Deborah Fries from Boston Patch Initiative is on the investment committee. Um, and then they do some of the more traditional due diligence uh, uh, work that a lot of us are familiar with. Um, they surface uh, questions that we may not ask or that members may not ask, uh, comments, et cetera. So that's, that's another body. Um, so that's another a level of governance. But they don't have ultimate power. Uh, so this is a body that has more traditional expertise, and they understand they are there for guidance, and they understand that ultimately um, it is the members who will decide. Um, the investment committee makes a recommendation, um, and then that recommendation goes to our members for a final vote. Uh, so our members are uh, bringing us the list of businesses that we are to consider. Uh, there is, uh, there is um, as I said, some other bodies that do some additional, that additional work that complements the work that our members do, um, and then our members have the final vote. Uh, so I think that that's, that's one of the ways that we um, disrupt, so to speak, uh, some, of, some, of the, some of the ways that decision-making, for example, is tied to certain types of wealth or certain types of expertise um, or, or certain types of um, power. Uh, the last thing I'll say, and I'll, before I throw it to Ojan to talk a little bit, is um, each member gets one vote. Um, and this is regardless of investment amount. This is regardless of participation amount. Uh, this is regardless of community uh, stature or some type of other leadership position. Um, if you are a Ujima member, um, you get one vote, and uh, that's it. And you do not have to invest to vote, which is also important. Um, and we have plenty of investors who are not members, and so we have plenty of investors that don't vote as well. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can y'all hear me? Yeah. Right. I, I love the way that this question is phrased because it, it lets me cover so many different things. Um, so I'm the finance director at the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, you've already heard a little bit about our organization from Noni. Um, and we're a multi-stakeholder cooperative, which means we have different categories of owners who are all co-owners in the cooperative. Um, and we're also a California cooperative corporation, which through that legal structure gives us certain requirements for democratic control and also gives us a lot of flexibility in how we want to expand that democratic control through our everyday practices. This is a framework that we were introduced to and helped organize with um, the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And we're still um, you know, ironing out the details. It's always an iterative process to figure out how do we best do this. Um, but I kind of want to approach this through the second part of the question around how we structure our capital so that it doesn't take the front seat. Um, and this way of thinking about this that I'm going to share with you is actually inspired by Aaron Tanaka. Last year at SOCAP went on a little rant about what it means to uh, democratize capital. And I was like, yeah, so let me, um, I want to share with you like what I see as it takes to democratize capital. And I think there's three components, at least that, with this perspective I'm coming from. One is providing access to folks who don't have access to that capital, right? And for East Bay Prec, those folks are our resident owners. Folks who otherwise are renters for their lifetime aren't able to, uh, to get credit. To, they're not, you know, not made for the entitlement process that our, um, our systems use. Sorry, the underwriting process that our systems use. Um, so we're democratizing capital by giving access to those residents who don't have access to capital. But we're also providing investment opportunity 
for everyday people, right? Not just uh, impact investors, not just accredited investors, but any Californian can invest up to $1,000 in the co-op. And next year, we're going to be launching a direct public offering so anyone can invest more than $1,000 in the co-op. Because right now, a lot of folks' money is just sitting in Wells Fargo, and it's actually funding the problems that we're trying to fix. Um, in fact, uh, I recently read an article called uh, Workers and Renters of the World Unite and Jacobin talking about how a lot of labor unions' pensions are investing in the projects that are displacing those very, um, those very workers. So, the, so yeah, providing investment opportunity to invest in local control of community assets. Um, and then the last part is that we don't want only our investors and our residents to be in control. We actually want folks who are just a part of the community to be able to have a say, right? Part of democratizing capital is how do, how do you have some control over what goes on in your neighborhood so it's not just siloed to some banker and the person who's moving into the house next door. So we have a third type of owner, which is just our community owner. You don't have to be an investor. You just have to be a community member, show up to meetings, and the dues are as little as $10 a year because we really don't want funds to be the barrier to entry to the co-op. And lastly, we have our staff owner. So our, our fourth category of ownership. And now with multi-stakeholder cooperatives, decision making is sort of complicated. Um, we have a yearly uh, member meeting. We're actually going to be having our first member meeting, um, I think on December 5th is our, our date. So we're going to be excited to troubleshoot the problems of, you know, what does our turnout look like? And um, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Um, but that's, you know, that, and that's where everyone gets one vote. One member, one vote. We actually have an investor who's putting in $50,000 and many who are putting in $1,000. So they get the same vote as somebody who put in $10 a year. Outside of the member meetings, the day-to-day -day operations of the co-op are modeled um, loosely off of something called holacracy, which is kind of a democratic decision-making system that was born out of tech that we're sort of adopting for our purposes and iterating on, where our members themselves in particular, our community members and our uh, resident members, not really the investor owners, get to participate in the day-to-day -day operations of the cooperative as much as they want by creating circles or committees, subcommittees, um, for, to, to, to work on whatever they really want to work on, whether that's um, a group of community members who want to organize around a project. They create a circle, and the staff works with them to you know, do the process of organizing, doing the financial due diligence, you know, coming up with pro formas, raising the funds, purchasing the project. Um, or if it's just a group of folks who are interested in passing tenant option to purchase in Oakland, we can create a circle around that. And um, in that way, one of our goals is to have place-based decision-making power and many, a, a polycentric power structure, right, where it's not all the power is centered in one location, but based on who's impacted, who's interested, power can be held in many circles. Um, now, one of the realities is that we have to own that the staff, the staff owners at East Bay Prec basically are given the trustee responsibility from the board to run the cooperative. So one of our challenges is finding the balance of how much power does the staff exercise? Because we're the ones ultimately implementing the ideas, the decisions of our community owners. Um, and needing to do that in a way that, one of the challenges, and I guess we're going to go to challenges soon, but is really that capacity to participate. Frontline communities don't have as much capacity to show up to your monthly circles than you know, folks who don't have to work. So um, maybe I'll leave it at that. Have to that, and sorry, I feel like my chair is breaking, so I'm going to switch it out in a little bit. Um, is you know, I think this is as we talk about transforming communities, right? Is like transforming people's understand uh, understanding to governance, right? When we have a governance system where we are told to turn out and vote every four years in an election under the guise of voter suppression, under the attacks of Citizens United laws. Um, part of what we're also trying to figure out is how do we work with those frontline communities, directly impacted communities that have been alienated from their voice and their vote to actively show up and participate in the work, right? Um, one of my mentors, Syra Pinto, talks about um, she's trained in holding circles from an indigenous community in um, Canada. And they do not make a decision, they do not start any of their meetings until everybody is present. 
right? So it means people have to actively show up all the time and participate and be engaged. And so I'm wondering, um, and you start to touch on this, Ojamba, once if you want to add anything else, Nia, about what has been kind of the learning curve, the capacity building, the human development for people to actually recognize their agency and their voice and their vote to participate um, in the work that you guys do? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this has been a lot of fun because it's been very, very hard. Um, we so far, I would say, we, we so far we have had two pretty big um, concerted voting efforts that have been drastically different. Um, and for me, what's, what's fun, I think, is what we learn about each other um, with these processes. Uh, our very first uh, election was for our Community Standards Committee. Uh, so this, uh, this was an election to elect six people from our general membership um, to be liaisons with the, the larger body about the community standards process. Um, we have weekly meetings, um, which is hard. Um, and in those weekly meetings for a period of four months from January to April uh, 2018, we would ask our members about topics from waste to ownership to worker power, et cetera. And then this, the job of this body was to then take that input, uh, combine it with, with their input, and pr produce some type of proposal for community standards. Um, we, to, we, had, we had a nomination process um, that we had to um, kind of jumpstart by kind of nominating a couple of people ourselves um, and encouraging uh, our members to nominate other people, um, just thinking about the role of staff. Um, and we had a, a candidates forum at, at one of our, our meetings where our members had an opportunity to meet uh, who was running um, if they didn't know them already. And we said, um, this would take about a week. For us, quorum is 50% plus one. Um, we would like to have, uh, at, at some point, we would, we would like that percentage to be higher, but we, what we said was we wanted to be able to at least say that a majority of our members have chosen something uh, to feel like it's properly representative. Um, as an aside, um, our attorneys, when they heard that our quorum was 50% plus one, said, do you maybe want to think about 10% or 20%? Um, because we don't know how you're going to get 50%. Plus one. And we said, Absolutely not. Uh, we're we're going to go. Did my mic go? Oh, here it is. Um, so we we said it would take us about a week to get to reach quorum. Um, a week came and went. We did not reach quorum. We extended the voting period for another two weeks. And so then that voting period was three weeks, and, and we reached quorum. Um, we reached quorum by uh, me texting every single member that <laughs> that I knew and that I felt uh, comfortable hounding via text message and saying, hey, vote, um, and, and doing some phone banking. Okay, that, that's a guide. We, we then went into our second uh, big election, uh, which comprised four different questions. Uh, the first question was, what financial institution will we put our undeployed capital in? The second question was, we've gotten this list of 140 businesses from you all. We need a, a final ratification. We need, a, we need an okay. There are no flags on any of these businesses. Let's, let's send the list through and let's start working on it. Uh, the third question was, we have this list of 36 community standards. Again, let's ratify it and let's say we're going to move on this. And then the fourth was um, a parallel process that we had created to create investment partners, for example, um, Boston Impact Initiative, to first say, can we have an investment partner process? And then can you approve 10 investment partners that we have, we have chosen? Uh, so four, four meaty questions. Um, we needed to have those questions answered before we can make any investments, um, pr particularly uh, where we would hold our capital and what businesses we would invest in and the community standards. Um, we said this will take three weeks. It took us three weeks last time. Let's do three weeks. Um, three weeks came and went, no quorum. A month came and went, no quorum. Two months came and went, no quorum. Um, three months came and went, no quorum. And this is with texting, the texting worked last time, uh, phone banking, emails, hounding. Uh, we finally reached quorum after four months. 
on, on the first ballot. Um, two drastically different decisions. So what immediately opened up for, so, and as we're troubleshooting along the way, we are managing questions like, um, well, we asked members where should we put our money because members were asking that question. Members were asking, well, where are you going to put it in the meantime? So it's our sense that this is important, and if it's important, we should put it to the whole body. Maybe it was not as important as we thought it was for everyone. So there's a, there's a question of what is the important decision um, that people want to make. People don't want to make a ton of decisions. So we knew that for sure. We knew that we had to watch out for decision fatigue. Uh, so that was one thing. Um, a second was we got some feedback from members who didn't realize, actually, I think to your point, just about the history of alienation. Um, there's there's a context that we're all operating with, and we're bringing and we're we're bringing tons of background information into these processes. We're not entering these fresh or or, or new or naive. Um, so democracy doesn't have the greatest rep right now <laughs> um, in, in any corner. Um, and so we did get some feedback from members who told us, we, I didn't actually think my vote was that important. Um, and we had to say, we had to send emails, for example, that said, we will not make an investment if you do not vote. So we have this money that will sit here and we will lose money <laughs> um, and we will not invest. And, and, and this is not a joke. So um, there, was, there was definitely, I think, that, and, and this is what I mean, saying just learning about people, that kind of learning what, what motivates people and, and whether or not people understand democracy to be real. So just, just um, uh, bumping into that. And so when people learn, like, oh, I'm holding up the process, my vote actually is important, um, they, they, were mo they were moved. And I mean, there are tons of other, other questions I can bring up that we're still uh, working through. Anything you want to add? I know you guys are getting ready for December 5th, but as you kind of listen to Nia's comments, anything that comes up for you? Well, first I just want to say that Ujima was a big inspiration as we were coming up with our bylaws and figuring out how we were going to do this. So just feeling really grateful for the work y'all have put in and continuing to learn as y'all are learning. Um, there's a couple things I guess I wanted to share. One is that like even just being a part of a staff collective that operates horizontally and democratically, this has become sort of like spiritual, personal growth work for a lot of us. Like imagine if every workplace conflict you ever had could only be resolved by really resolving it and not by just moving forward by your boss telling you what to do or you telling your subordinate what to do, right? Um, and I think that's something that's coming up for a lot of our members too. They come to our meetings and we're really grappling with these questions about reparations and who's in the room. Um, as Amaka said, we're, you know, our first member meeting is coming up, so I don't have a lot of lessons learned from that yet, but trying to, to really prepare for that. Um, one, one lesson that I feel like I'm currently learning is um, we, we have a community owner circle right now that we launched back in February after we had you know, opened up the membership for the cooperative, and we were like, great, we'll just we'll open up this community owner circle. It'll be a first place for community owners to get involved, and we'll do it downstairs in our shared office space with Selk. Um, and what's happening is that that community owner circle is becoming mostly white. And it makes me realize that we were maybe not, and I'll, I'll admit that I was the one really pushing for us to do that. The rest of the co-op was kind of like, well, maybe let's wait. We're not quite ready. But I was like, wait, we need to have community input. But the folks who were able to show up at that time and in that space, because it's downtown, it's not in West Oakland or in East Oakland where the black communities we're really trying to serve are, it just shows you who's showing up to that space. So in planning our member meeting, we're trying to think of how do we make sure that that's also a space the right people can show up to. And it's not just our investors who are you know, mostly white and might have you know, the time and opportunity to show up in the space we choose if we're not very thoughtful about it. So um, I would say this is definitely something um, we, tried, we tried to think about early. Um, and uh, I think what we tried to do is design um, entry, well, we tried to create as many entryways into Ujima as possible. Um, and, and design them um, so that they are diverse, for lack of a better word, to match people's lifestyles. And so try to be, um, what's the word, uh, cognizant of the different lives that we all, all lead 
and what brings us to a place. So as I said, we have weekly, we weekly meetings, and that's definitely um, for the person who can do that. So for the person who has the time, uh, who has that level of um, energy, passion, et cetera. Uh, but those are not the only entryways into Ujima. Um, I think one of the things that, that um, had us in conversation with Ambitious, for example, is we have a very specific arts and cultural organizing focus, for example. Um, and one of the things we, we thought about is um, kind of de-emphasizing like, the traditional community meeting um, as the form of gathering. Um, and and, not, and not, not prioritizing that at the expense of everything else. So uh, one of the first things we did, for example, um, when we were staffed up is we, we um, staffed up meaning actually had like a person working <laughs> at Ujima, um, was we had a party. Um, and we said uh, there, there are so many uh, community meetings that look and feel the same. Um, there's skepticism. Um, coming in the door because there's there's an there's an idea of of how that's going to go and what's going to and what's going to happen afterwards and usually people are not wrong. Um, there there used to be I used there used to be a joke that I used to have with a couple of friends of mine that someone could actually make a lot of money like um, writing a sitcom about community meetings because um, they're they're the archetypes they're the characters they're there's like the course of events you know what's going to happen um, and so some people have started to opt out because um, they're tired of that type of engagement. Um, and so we said, well, let's have a party. Let's have something that's the agenda. Uh, we're not fundraising. Um, this is a way people come together. People socialize. And so we just, we had a party. Um, it was house music. Um, maybe less house music. Maybe more. <laughs> maybe more. <laughs> maybe more hip hop. Um, so that's one of the things. We, we have a lecture series. Um, that we do, and, and, and the the thing that made me think about responding to you is, we're also multi, we're multiracial, we're multi-class, and what's been interesting to me is, is is to see how our different members engage differently. Uh, so we have a lecture series, for example, um, where we have more of our members of color showing up to that lecture series than to the weekly meetings. Um, I have some theories about why. Again, it's attached to why we decided to do a party. Um, for example, we had an event actually where one community member came up to me afterwards and said, this was fantastic, and this was a restaurant we were doing. A couple of um, friends, I said, I'm at community meeting because everyone just fights all the time, so I'm not going to tell them. It was um, so we, we try to think about what are the, what are the, the different ways. Um, there, there are different types of engagement have with us. There are varying levels of frequencies. Um, the lecture I mentioned that happens like bi-monthly, for example. We use Zoom, so we use technology. So we let people know if you us in the room, you can join us um, at home. And, and, a, and, a, and a pushback, because then I, I say technology, and then I get an automatic, well, do people of color or working class people have technology? Yes, we do. We use it. Um, <laughs> so that also should not be like an automatic response, like assuming like we don't have the capacity to, to access technology. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting I'm getting these cue cards, and so I really want to make sure we kind of get to the next piece, and I want to kind of put this next question towards you, no pressure, but as the finance director, want to start actually talking about capital and the capitalization of these projects. Um, and want to lift it up first from a place of just really honoring Many communities, low-income communities of color that have been marginalized have been directly impacted by capital in a way that it creates trauma when we start to talk about money, right? When we start to ask people about thinking about what does it mean to invest, what does it mean to, um, to fundraise, um, what does it mean to be in a relationship with an individual or an institution um, that you may have to kind of pay money back, right? And so as we kind of talk about culture and the role of culture in creating healing, I'm wondering if you could spend some time really talking about what has been your experience, right, in fundraising, um, financing the projects that you guys are supporting through East Bay Prec, and particularly if you could kind of talk us through like the strategy and how you've sequenced the different tranches of capital that you've looked to bring into the project, right? So you started off by telling us about this um, community capital circle that you hosted. Um, wanting to know a little bit more about why that strategy, what was that, what pool of money was that supposed to raise, and how does that kind of relate once again to this question around building power, right? Absolutely. And we have, yeah. 
five minutes, sorry. Now I get the hard, you know, time thing, so we're gonna try to squeeze it all in, thanks. Absolutely, so not quite sure how to answer that question, so I'll just say that um, part of what we're trying to do is create access to a wide variety of forms of capital for these community groups who otherwise, you know, wouldn't even be able to qualify for a loan or know how to organize with their five housemates to try to purchase a property together. So we combine, um, you know, institutional funding where it's available and reasonably, you know, priced, um, city or state regional funding, and, uh, you know, funding from community members, whether it's, you know, someone who considers himself an impact investor, but more broadly speaking, our, our community of everyday people who can invest in the cooperative. Um, for this first project that we did, it was in partnership with the Land Trust, Northern California Land Trust. Um, Presidio Bank brought in a chunk of the capital stack. Measure KK from the city of Oakland brought in a, ch a chunk of the capital stack. And we actually finished the capital stack with our community investment campaign, raising $200,000 from folks here in the community. Um, and what that does is, besides you know having the community invested more than you know monetarily, but like personally in in uh, our black and brown community staying here in Oakland, it also lowers the cost of capital. We're paying, we're offering a 1.5% annual dividend, which is optional actually. When you invest in UB Prec, you can say, no thanks, I don't need my dividend. So that brings the cost of capital down, which translates directly into lower rents for those, um, those residents. As we grow as a cooperative, right, this was our first project, which is why that institutional funding kind of came first in partnership with the land trust. As we grow, that might change. Um, we had an experience with the uh, CDFI that I won't name, but this is probably pretty common practice where for this first property, we were looking to, to take out a loan or get a line of credit or something to allow us to purchase. And they asked what other assets we had. And you know, we're a new company, we didn't have any. We had $100,000 in the bank, but that's not gonna take you very far in terms of real estate here. And they said, you know, once you have a million dollar asset, we'll be able to loan to you on this other property. We're not gonna ask that this loan be backed by your other million dollars, it's sort of irrelevant, except we just want you to already have something, even though their loan was gonna be backed by the property we were purchasing. So, that's not great, but what we're, <laughs> what we're doing is hopefully building our own capacity as an organization to say, oh wow, we have these five other properties, it's gonna be a lot easier for us to capitalize properties in the future because of the collective wealth that we're building. And that's why we're not just focusing on creating little pockets of limited equity housing cooperatives, but creating an overarching cooperative that shares these assets for community you know, strength. We're doing another thing that I think will also help to then weave together um, Ujima's uh, capital stack is um, while we oftentimes talk about fundraising from philanthropy or getting money from financial institutions like CDFIs, really sorry to hear about that horrible story, um, what we've also been trying to lift up over the course of the last couple of days, right, is that there's purchasing and buying power that already exists within our communities, right? And so the community capital raise has also been a significant part of both the projects that you guys support. And I'm curious if you have any like highlights, ahas, um, bright moments of what the community has seen in their ability to kind of raise money from their, from their own income to really support a lot of these groundbreaking projects that you guys are working on. I can think about, um, I mean, I will, not this current process because we're still raising, but the, the pilot process that we did in 2016, uh, which was um, we raised $10,000 from 175 community members. Uh, then we, and we received matching money from Boston Impact Initiative, The Working World, and LISC Boston. Um, and uh, so in a day, um, we allocated twenty thousand dollars in loans, um, and and we definitely um, received across the board um, positive feedback from people um, present um, who said it was inspiring. Um, and um, you know, I, I, and and for me, that's a, that is a, a key moment in Eugene's trajectory. Um, I think that that. Uh, th that was the only way, really, we could have enrolled community members, um, was to have something successful. And so I think, and I think of something Jessica had said to me, um, well, not to me, but to, to a smaller room of people um, 
a, a little while ago, and I'm also just thinking of of Noni just kind of talking about the history of, of Black people in this in this country. Um, there there's a history of of hope and failure, and so I think definitely um, pressures uh, that Black people um, move with is uh, wanting to be hopeful. And, and one of the things that I've loved about Ujima is giving our communities permission to try and to experiment and possibly fail and also understand that we have community members who have that, who have that deep history. And so for some of our community members, it better go off. It better work. Um, you can't just come and talk about something. Um, you, have to, you have to do it and you have to be able to show so that it so so that it works, um, and so we did see that with the um, with with the pilot, and I think if we were not able to pull that off, um, we would we would not have community enrollment in this. We, you know, everybody else might be excited about it, but <laughs> community members would would feel differently. I think. Anything you want to add on that point? Um, as you guys are still raising all the all the monies. I'm not sure. It is, it is true that, well, I don't know. I kind of want to give time to go to the next question. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, good timing. We just got the Time's Up card. Um, so would love to kind of pivot towards um, our Q&A. We're going to stop live streaming um, for this next portion. Um, and so plan for um, the, the group that